Wednesday. Shape it in the way we teach English. Webinar course. Shaping the way we teach English. Webinar Wednesday. Hello and welcome to Shaping the Way We Teach English Webinar Course 14, brought to you by the American English Team. My name is Jennifer Hodgson and I am part of the American English Team based in Washington, D.C. So welcome teachers from all around the world. This morning I've seen teachers from Tanzania, Uzbekistan, Nepal, Thailand, and so many other countries around the world. Even though we all teach across the world, it's great to be able to connect, at least virtually, and support each other as a community of teachers. So here you can see our Course 14 schedule, with today's webinar being the third webinar of Course 14. So we still have three more to look forward to after today. During these webinars, you will hear but not see the presenter. And the way for you to participate is by using the chat box, as you are already doing. This is where you can ask questions or make comments related to today's topic. Of course, not every question will be answered during the session, as there are often hundreds of teachers participating. However, there is another place for you to ask questions after the webinar that I will show you in just a few minutes. Your pre presenter may also ask you questions in the form of polls. These are multiple choice questions that will appear on your screen. You will also see myself, moderator Jenny, and moderator Heather in the chat box to assist you. Some people may experience technical problems, and unfortunately we cannot fix individual technical issues, but we will let you know if we are having a global issue. If you do lose sound, a great way to follow along is with the caption pod, as you see at the bottom of the screen. Webinar courses consist of six webinars, and during the course, webinars take place every other Wednesday. Participants who attend at least four out of six webinars receive an e-certificate from their regional English language officer or local U.S. Embassy. To ensure you are eligible for the e-certificate, we ask you to submit your attendance at the very end of the webinar. Please do not submit it before we request it or we won't be able to count it. So for individuals, meaning you are at your own computer watching this webinar by yourself, all you will need to do is submit your email address at the very end. And for viewing hosts, meaning you have a large group of teachers in one space together, um, we need your email address and the number of participants. You can see both examples on the screen. We hope that many of you are familiar with our name site, but if you haven't registered yet, uh, please do join this site. You must first register to join the site, and then your membership should be approved within 24 hours. On the NING, you can find discussions related to each topic. We hope you've already joined the discussion for today's topic. And then you'll find a page for each webinar that includes reading and resources. And then after the webinar, you'll find the recording and the PowerPoint. Also, if you have any remaining questions after the webinar, this is a great place to ask. In addition, the American English team has a lot of other resources that are great for teachers of English. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of Activate, Games for Learning American English. Well, I think I see lots of hands being raised. Um, Activate is a compilation of games that are easy and fun to use in the English classroom. These are all free and downloadable from our website. So go to our website, AmericanEnglish.state.gov, and if you search for Activate, you'll be able to find all of these free games. So, welcome 
Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the American English team. I'm excited to introduce our session entitled Strange Weather, Climate Change Activities for the English Classroom. One of the most pressing issues in our world is global warming or climate change. Is it happening and how fast and what can we do? Our presenters believe the first step towards solving a problem is knowing that there is a problem. This webinar will review key themes related to climate change and the environment and will provide relevant, thought-provoking activities and materials that teachers can easily use in their English language classes. Today we are lucky, lucky to have presenters joining us from two different locations in Eastern Europe. I'm happy to welcome Kevin McCoy and Eve Smith. Kevin is the Regional English Language Officer in Ukraine and is a frequent presenter in the Shaping the Way We Teach English webinar course. He's concerned about the environment and thinks that English class provides a great opportunity to increase awareness on the subject. Kevin plays music and likes to create audios for language learning too. Eve is serving as a Senior English Language Fellow in Georgia for the 2014-2015 school year. She is an avid scuba diver and she introduces environmental education elements in her EFL lessons in response to the vis visible impact pollution has had on the ocean over the last decade. This is her first webinar and she is excited to participate. So welcome Kevin and Eve. Strange weather, strange weather, strange weather. Thank you for that introduction, um, American English team in Washington, D.C. Today, strange weather, climate change activities for the English classroom. My name is Kevin McCoy. I'm here in Kiev where the weather is absolutely beautiful. And my co-presenter, teaching specialist Eve Smith, is located in the Republic of Georgia. Yes, that means that we are coming to you along with Jenny and Heather in Washington, D.C. from three different countries. You've got to love webinars. So just raise your hand if you love webinars. And I'm sure we've got 50 participants from 50 countries around the world. And that's great because we have a global issue today. Our goals for this webinar are pretty simple. We'd like to increase your awareness. These are the two things that Eve Smith and I want to do here. First, provide an overview to climate change using pictures, very few words, and not a lot of heavy science. We want to show you how to explain climate change to your class, whatever the level. Second, we want to provide some simple activities and some resources, like projects. Many of them are aimed at getting learners just to think about the environment. Very simple. And we're going to show you some great American English state.gov resources, which of course are free. So let's move on to part one. You've probably heard these terms a lot, global warming and climate change. How are they different? And is it really happening? Well, in our poll that we had in the lobby before the webinar started, Almost all of you, about 84%, believe that, yes, this is really happening. Uh, and most of the scientists around the world do as well. And that's good, because if you believe that climate change is really happening, you are more likely to take action. So here we go. What is happening? 
on the earth is an atmosphere. That atmosphere contains the air we breathe. You can see it there on the screen. It holds in some heat from the sun while other heat escapes. It's kind of like when you put on a sweater, you retain some heat. This keeps the Earth's climate moderate. It also contains the air we breathe. By the way, all the graphics you're going to see come from two great sources, the Environmental Protection Agency and NASA. And the links for those will be on the Ming, so don't you worry. You've probably heard this term a lot too, the greenhouse effect. What does a greenhouse do? It takes in the sun's energy and holds it, right? So while it's cold outside, you can see the snowman there, heat is provided enough to grow plants on the inside. That's what the Earth's atmosphere is, does. But it's not made of glass, obviously. It's made of gas. Still, the gas has a similar function. It holds in the heat. In places where there are no atmosphere, the warmth goes right out to space, which is why this guy is dressed in his winter clothes, because outer space is very cold. Now, gases are not all bad. We need them. They're a natural part of the atmosphere and the environment. What's bad is when humans create too many man-made gases, and the number one villain is carbon dioxide, and we put these in the atmosphere. These gases come from factories, from power stations, electricity, cars. Did you know that there are one billion cars in the world today? I can't wait to see the parking lot where the, so that holds them all. And you can see some of the sources of greenhouse gas here. These are called emissions, and emission is something that's produced in the making of energy and sent into the atmosphere. So you can see it's basically the creation of power. When we create power, there's a byproduct, and these can be harmful emissions. Now here's where the problem occurs. There's a natural balance in our atmosphere of gases. But when man-made pollution creates changes, even a little, it can upset the balance. So now the sun's light is coming through the atmosphere and, it's, and some of it is not going out. It is staying inside the atmosphere because our pollution is thicker. Our sweater, so to speak, is thicker. thicker. That results in a warming of the whole planet. Yeah, it's a little tiny warming, but it still makes a difference. And gases go global. They go all around the world. And let's look at what happens with different planets. Venus has tons of greenhouse gases. Clouds keep in all those gases. So it's very hot. Try 482 degrees Celsius. Mars is only about 55 degrees Celsius below zero. So it doesn't have, it can't retain very many of these helpful greenhouse gases. However, the middle one was just right. And that's a planet that we like to call Earth. Now, what happens when temperature rises just a tiny bit? when global warming occurs. This is what we call, uh, it affects the climate. 
You'll notice that all these things are interconnected. When we get warmer oceans, for example, um, we get rising sea levels. We get melting snow and ice. This affects people and animals. Habitats change. Here's one example scientists are talking about. If the Earth becomes warmer, the habitat for mosquitoes will increase. We'll get more mosquitoes in more parts of the world. Mosquitoes are a little bit dangerous, and they're not very fun. Here are some of the results that we see. And many of you are saying you have seen changes in your region in the last years. Um, this is from that Environmental Protection Agency website, which has great graphics for teaching about the climate to, to kids, kids like me. So we see changing rain and snow patterns. That's one of the effects of global warming. You can see three of them here, changes in animal migration. There's actually 11 in this picture. Can you see any other results in this picture? Less snow and less ice. Still, there's eight more that are pictured here. Water cycle, Kaniko mentions. Yes, that's important too. Wildfire, thank you, Brazil. Thais from Brazil. Drought, yes, those are all. Fire, uh huh. Fewer trees, mm hmm. Drought is when it's hot and there's not enough water, right? Okay, poor farming. Good. Anything else in the picture? Deforestation. Thank you, Tatiana from Brest in Belarus. Yes, deforestation. Let's look here. All these things, higher temperatures mean more heat waves, more droughts, more wildfires. Changes in plant life cycles, that will affect agriculture. Damaged corals means a great number of fish will lose their place to live. Okay, so now we see climate change. But I want to make something clear here, the distinction between climate versus weather. Um, here's Mark Twain's definition. Can you imagine what he put in these blanks? Climate is what we, let me give you two choices. Climate is what we expect, weather is what we get. So when you go to a place like um, Florida, you expect warm weather. But if it's cold and rainy, that's what you get. In other words, weather is short term, what you see outside the window. And climate is long term, measured over centuries, or even longer. Now let's take some polls to see if the Earth is changing and how it's been changing. How much has the Earth's average temperature increased? We can't see how many people are voting here, but uh, there we go. Thank you. Um, this is true. Yeah. Yes, the Earth's temperature has increased since the late 1800s. Let's go to the next poll. And the 1800s, you might know, as the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. 
does global warming affect ocean life? Indeed, again, this is true. You are correct. It does affect ocean life a lot. Um, in fact, uh, the ocean is our good friend because it absorbs about half of these gases, but it is getting too many right now, and that is causing problems in the actual chemistry of the ocean. One result is that corals are dying. Okay, let's see the third poll, please. Okay, the last decade, the last full decade, And this is also true, the warmest decade ever. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the next poll, if we have one more. Or back to the slideshow. Ah, and how have you noticed? So uh, we had this poll before the webinar started and I'm astonished how many of you think that the weather has been changing in your region. So from personal experience, we are seeing some strange weather. Okay, thank you for taking those polls. So now, here's a big question. What can you you're thinking, what can I do about it? And why teach this in the English class? Those are excellent questions. Here's my answer. It's great subject matter. All English classes need subject matter. And this one is of vital importance. And if you can get good activities, use it. You might even team up with the science people at your school. It's such an important subject, why not introduce it in the classroom? So the main thing is spread the news. If we have maybe 500 teachers, sometimes we have 1,000 teachers at these webinars. If you increase your students' awareness of the problems, that's one step towards a solution. There's a lot we can do on a personal level. For example, reduce your carbon footprint. What's a carbon footprint? Well, this term is used today to mean the amount of carbon, that bad gas, that your activities put into the environment. In other words, how much do your activities, your use of power, contribute to global warming? If you drive a car every day, you have a bigger carbon footprint than if you only walk. I'm curious, how many people have a car? You can raise your hand. Don't type in the chat box, just please raise your hand. So we have a lot, but I'm, I'm assuming there's probably a lot of people here that don't have a car as well. I, for one, do not have a car. You can also reduce your carbon footprint in other ways. Take walk or take public transport. Even unplugging your cell phone charger. When you leave it in the wall, it might be warm, it's actually using a little bit of energy. You can recycle. You can plant trees. Um, and you can spread the word to your students. I, for one, love walking, so I walk to work every day. Or take the metro. But here's a little song I'd like to play about walking. And while it's playing, think, hmm, how could I use this in my classroom? It's a very, very short song. So think about it. 
and listen to the song Walking. One, two, three, four. Forget the car. Forget the car. We're not going far. We're not going far. We like walking. We sure do. Walking, walking, walking. 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 It's good for you. Walking, 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 walking. It's good for you. Doesn't cost a thing. Doesn't cost a thing. Walking, walking, walking. 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 Thank you for playing that. Interesting. Someone said, I'm in, uh, there's a lot of pollution where he walks. That's a problem, isn't it? If you drive a car, you're contributing to the pollution, making more of a carbon footprint. But if you walk, you're suffering too. This is one of our problems. Um, but we've got to pitch in to do the best we can. Many people say they need to use their car. I completely understand that far away from school. So can anyone suggest what ways you might use this song in your classroom? It's very short, so it's easy to use when you have five free minutes. As an energizer, okay, Marie. Yeah, you could actually have students walk to the beach as an energizer. Thanks, Marina from Ukraine. As a warm up, okay. Icebreaker activity, okay. Introduction to a lesson, good. Okay. How about a dictation? Playing it several times and having students write the words. That would be language oriented too. Okay, well, thank you for your suggestions. And now, after that overview, I hope you have a good understanding, a simple understanding of climate change. I'm going to turn things over to my partner, who, like me, loves the ocean and loves sharks. Yeah, we both love sharks. This is Eve Smith in Tbilisi, Georgia. Thank you, Kevin. In this section, I will be discussing project ideas and resources with you. After this section, Kevin will come back and introduce some shorter activities that you can use in your classroom um, if you don't have quite the time needed for projects. But first, I'd like to start with this question. What did you do to save the world today? I saw this graffiti on a building in Tbilisi, and I loved it because it made me stop and think, I, what have I done to save the world today? I used reusable water container when I was outside the house. I brought my own bag to the grocery store. I unplugged my cell phone charger. So I did some activities, but maybe not enough. Oh yes, and as many of you said, I also walk. <laughs> to work. So throughout this webinar and for the rest of today, take a minute to reflect on what you do to help reduce your carbon footprint. I see that a lot of you are saying you don't buy plastic bottles, you take bikes, you turn off um, the lights whenever you're in the house, you're planting trees around the school, those are fantastic. Using less plastic, wonderfully done. So let's continue to think about how we can reduce our carbon footprint throughout the rest of today. So there are so many topics we can work on when discussing the environment. As a scuba diver, I like to focus on shark appreciation because 10 million sharks are killed every year for things like medicine and shark fin soup. So you can see we start the general topics on this list with carbon footprints and then shark finning. Shark finning is horrible because people take the fins off of the, um, off of the shark and then they drop the animal while it is still alive back into the ocean to die. 
Sharks are very, very important because they are like the honeybees of the sea. I noticed that one of you mentioned honeybees earlier when we were talking about the problem that this change in weather is leading to. So as the honeybees of the sea, sharks, if they die out, um, we will all eventually die out as well because they are very important to the cycle of life. Another topic listed on this list of general topics is deforestation. This means cutting down of trees through logging. It's also important to us because the trees are the oxygen of our world. Um, raise your hand if you agree and raise your hand if you love trees. I saw that many of you said that they like to plant, that you like to plant trees around your school. Um, but today, what we are going to focus on is plastic. And the reason for this is because plastic is just as important to keeping sharks alive and is related to all of us in our day-to-day -day lives. So one of the ways we can discuss plastic in the ESL, ESL classroom is to have students do projects. Here we can see a list of different projects they can do. They can create their own comics for their community and maybe publish in a school newspaper or a local newspaper. They can make a petition. So a petition is when they write down a problem or an element they would like to change and then they either write a solution or they get a lot they collect a lot of signatures and they present this solution to the government to an organization or to an industry wherever they want to see this change posters are another type of project you can have students create a radio program a youtube video documentary and a public service announcement Today, we will discuss public service announcements. They are also known as PSAs. Don't worry if you don't have access to all of the tech that I am, or all of the technology that I am introducing at this point. Later, I will show you some other activities that you can do with just a pen and paper. So public service announcements can be TV advertisements, radio advertisements, a poster, a pamphlet, a web page, Facebook, t-shirts. You can also have blogs or Twitter accounts that are public service announcement orientated. Today, I'm going to introduce a public service announcement to you. And this public service announcement is on the Marine Debris blog. And we will be watching Jim Toomey, who is our TED Talk guy. For those of you who were able to log in to Ning early and watch his TED Talk, you will recognize him from that. If you haven't, I encourage you to watch it after this webinar. So he created a public service announcement for the Marine Debris blog and it has a lot of, um, this blog has a lot of really cool links and resources to projects and ideas that others are doing to combat the problem of trash and debris in our ocean. The short public service announcement video is called Two Minutes on Ocean. Okay, so let's walk through it really quickly so we know what it looks like. First, we start with a garbage can. And normally, when we throw things out, they go into a recycle area where we separate plastic, we can separate paper, and we can separate things like cans or aluminum. Sometimes, however, we have other avenues where we're not recycling. For example, this picture of a cruise ship, which is throwing its trash directly into the sea. So this trash goes to the bottom and sits there with the potential to kill the marine 
life around it. Another problem is sometimes we miss the trash can or the trash bin. And you can see here that it's raining and there's a bottle right next to the trash can. What happens next is that the bottle is washed away and says goodbye to us into the gutters and possibly into streams and rivers. And then it continues its journey to an ocean or sea or large body of water. There's a place in the Pacific Ocean where we have what we call the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. In this image, you can see that there are currents leading from all of the continents surrounding this Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and they lead to the center where Jim Toomey, in his public service announcement, says that there's a lot of trash that's stuck there. So this is obviously a problem. <laughs> um, and one of the things that he then talks about is what we can do to combat the trash. In this image, he's telling us if it doesn't make its way to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, oftentimes the trash will end up on beaches where there are no, there's not a lot of people visiting so that you know it comes from the ocean. These are the top 10 items that are removed from global coastlines and waterways. Look at number one. Is that a surprise? Raise your hand if that's a surprise to you. It's a cigarette butt. Number two are plastic bags. And then we see that number five are bottles. And then we continue to get in more information about other forms of trash that come up. So what can we do? The next stage in the public service announcement just basically shares with us what are the steps that we can take. Jim Tooney encourages us to talk to um, the industry, people who are selling you things, and encourage them to use less packaging on materials. You can see from this picture there's a wash where we can buy 40 individual packets or a concentrated load which uses 50% less packaging for the same thing. Another solution he gives us, instead of using plastic, make it all reusable, which I can see that from your comments that many of you are already doing. So that's our public service announcement from the Marine Debris blog by Jim Toomey. What I'd like to look at with us now are what are the elements of a public service announcement. The public service announcement that we can do with students could be 10 to 60 seconds long. It answers the following questions. Who, what, where, when, how, and why. It is persuasive, so the students are working on their arguments, and then there is a problem and a solution. So in Jim Toomey's public service announcement, we saw the problem was marine clutter and debris, right? Raise your hand if you agree. And we saw that the solution for that was to talk to and encourage the industries that produce our product to use less packaging and for the um, the actual bottles and the plastic, the idea was that we could use reusable items like a canvas bag um, instead. So those are the elements of a public service announcement. You can also create a poster. Posters are wonderful to hang around the school, around your classroom, or even around the community. You can see that this particular postal is on coral and why coral is very important, how it dies, and what we can do so that we are not harming the coral reef. So basically it says don't take coral home and don't buy coral souvenirs or jewelry. So in the chat, chat box, what I would love to hear from you are what are the language skills that can be developed through a public service announcement. 
I introduced the concept, but what are some skills that you can think about that will um, be encouraged developmentally with the students? For example, speaking. Excellent. I see that some of you have communication. Writing, absolutely. Very well done. Um, the usage of mental verbs, such as I like, I think. Let's see what else. Brainstorming, analytical thinking, critical thinking, commands. Very nice. Reading, modal. What else do we have? Listening, editing. Nice addition. Vocabulary, absolutely. Recycling a lot of the vocabulary that we, oh, and the do's and the don'ts, practicing that. Linking ideas. Wow, you all are coming up with amazing amounts. Using adjectives. All of the language skills, absolutely. Creativity as well. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing all of that. So you can see that a lot of language skills can be developed through public service announcements and creating a project. So a project oftentimes is longer than one class period. It could last several class periods, and this can be produced over several class periods. The next element I would like to introduce to you is a photo essay. So a photo essay is a series or set of photos gathered or taken to tell a story or provoke emotion. They contain all of the elements of a written story. I've created a photo essay for you using pictures from my skiing. Um, and I'd like you to use the chat box to tell me what do you think this story is about? Okay, in the forest, it could be about a holiday. Someone picked up that it was New Year. Trekking. Okay, interesting. I see that um, site from Tanzania, the climate. It's a winter vacation. It's a, it's a journey, a long journey. I like that because I think when I was putting this together, one of the things that I was thinking is a metaphorical journey because we're journeying into the new year, but also an actual journey where I'm skiing through the countryside to reach this wonderful log cabin. All right, wonderful. Thank you for your comments. So how can you use a photo essay in the classroom? So the first thing that I start with is raising the student's awareness of images and how they can tell the story from their own personal perspective. So we can start with an activity, what do you see? And they're basically looking around the classroom and thinking about and sharing with each other what do they see in the classroom. Kevin will give more details on this particular activity in just a few moments when he comes back. The nice thing about the, the um, excuse me, the photo essay or using a story in the classroom is it's community based. The students will be taking photos with, they could use their cell phones, they can use a regular phone, and they can also draw images if they're very artistic and even if they're not very artistic. So it, it chronicles their community and it chronicles their experience in the community. And Many of us know that when the students are using their experience in English, it's creating more meaningful interactions with them for the language. And so they're likely to um, remember it longer. So here is another photo essay on Pinterest. Now this one isn't quite telling a story, but it's still a photo essay because it's evoking an emotion or a feeling. So what I'm doing here is I'm choosing photos and I'm actually putting quotes underneath the photos. There's a handout on the name website and um, sorry, I'm reading one of the questions that we have and I'll answer that in a minute. In a minute. There's a, hand site, a, a handout called The Ocean, the Sea, and Me on the website. And in that handout, I have created a list of many, many famous 
quote about the ocean, about the sea, or about our personal relationship as humans to water. And so what I tried to do is take a photo and match the feeling or the mood of that quote to the photo. And then I put it on Pinterest, which is a fairly easy um, way to show your photos. Now I had a question about community-based. Community-based basically means that everything is related to your own community. So you're not necessarily doing a photo essay about something that is, if you're in Indonesia, you're not doing something in China. You're doing it in wherever you come from. My community right now is Tbilisi, Georgia. So if I do a photo essay, I will be doing it in Tbilisi, Georgia. Um, back to Pinterest. As you can see, you can sign up for Pinterest very easily. Here, um, it, there's a little icon with a pin in the top right hand corner of the screen and you can see my name Eve. Um, it's easy to sign up. It's easy to add photos to the board because there's a section on the middle on the left hand side where it says add a pin. You just click that and then you can choose to upload a photo or grab a photo from the internet and then you can create your um, quotes right under that photo. So here's another example. You can see some of the similar photos from the last one, but I added more to invoke more feeling um, and more of a storyline. The same with this about underwater life. Another wonderful way to integrate the, the themes of um, the ocean with our students is using cartoons. So we have short stories that we can do with cartoons. They are adventurous. They are fun. The cartoon characters should be active. One of the nice things about cartoons is that we, we know they are not realistic. So we can do anything that we want to with the cartoon. For example, here is a cartoon that I created called Leroy the Lemon Shark. And Leroy the Lemon Shark, as you can see, because he is a lemon shark, I felt that he should have a lemon of a personality, or maybe he's a little sour, so the glass is always half empty. In the chat box, can someone explain for us the phrase, the glass is always half empty, and what does that mean? So with Leroy, the, um, the lemon shark, I am, yeah, he's basically, as Maria says, from Ukraine, he is a pessimist. <laughs> and um, he, never, he never sees things. Uh, in a positive way. He sees things in a negative way. And he has a friend named Octavius the Octopus. And Octavius the Octopus, because he has such a large head, believes that he is amazing and brilliant. And he always loves to tell stories. And he begins every conversation with, have I told you about the time and then he goes into the story. So one of the, the reasons that I put these up is that I can use Leroy the Lemon Shark or Octavius the Octopus to talk about their hobbies, to talk about their family, to talk about a lot of the different themes that we find in our English uh, textbooks. So for example, Leroy, the lemon shark, I might have him go scuba diving because I love scuba diving and that's my hobby. So I might have him go very, very deep down into the ocean where there's no longer any light to find the, um, to find a giant squid or to find some very, very interesting critters. So you notice that Leroy the lemon shark is a little bit of a pessimist 
and some of you had a reaction to that, you can also have another shark who is the exact opposite and have him be an optimist. And so you can, you, you know, your students can play around with those. What I would love to see from you is if you can create your own cartoons and post them on our main website after we finish this webinar so we can see what you can come up with here. Also, if you are interested in using cartoons, join us November 5th for Using Comics in the ESL Classroom with James Whiting. Okay, finally, we're getting to a image of a cartoon that some of Kevin's some of Kevin's students created, and you can see this is about how damaging industry and cars are for us, and that the smoking from the factories is very dangerous for us and causes a lot of pollution. So there's many different ways to use cartoons. This image is um, Jim Tooney, to me again, learning from Sherman the Shark. This is the TED Talk that I put in our Ning resource page, and I hope you have time to watch it to get further ideas of how you can use cartoons and adapt the ideas in the classroom. I wanted to introduce some resources right before I turn you over to Kevin. This is Free Spirit Publishing House, and they are all free resources. This is a kid's guide to climate change and global warming, how to take action. And uh, you can download it as a PDF. It discusses all of the topics that we have mentioned previously, like carbon footprints, water shortages, deforestation. And here I have um, screen captured a section from the book so that you can see how they can be used. So this is a section where they're talking about the drought or a severe dry spell and if it is affecting the student's community, then what can they do at school to help stop this dry spell or drought? So it has the students do a quick brainstorm and gives them some ideas of how they can stop the overconsumption of water at school. This is the next stage, which is the action stage. So as you can see, it takes students through a series of steps that end with them educating others. And the action stage is where they either create a public service announcement um, or they choose to do something else like face-to-face -face interaction with people to talk about the problem in their community. So what I like about this is if you had any questions about how do I do a public service announcement in class, you can go through this book and you can download this material for free from the website and it will walk you through the different stages of how to prepare a project and a public service announcement. This is another separate activity just to give you an idea of some of the activities. This one is about global warming and it gives some information about where global warming is occurring in the world and the impact. And then there are some gaps where the students have to do a little research and fill in the gap themselves. So finally, I want to leave us with some scuba diving resources. You may be going, wait a minute, I'm not a scuba diver. Why is this person, why is Eve having me to look at scuba diving resources? The reason for this is because there's so many wonderful projects and programs that these scuba diving resources have for us. The one that I'm currently showing you is called Reef Check, and it talks about the coral reefs around the world. And it has a lot of information on news, events, galleries that you could use in the class with students to educate them about coral reefs, or they could use this information to create their public service and Another wonderful resource is called Project Aware. In this, it focuses mainly on sharks and marine debris, two things that we have talked about. So there's a, a section called the Resource Zone, which has a lot of different information that we may have to adapt, but that we could use 
in our classes for um, further information for the students. And finally, I'd like to leave you with another idea. And for those of you who live on a coastline or near a coast, within two hours from a coast, anywhere in the world, one thing that I would encourage you to do is talk to scuba, scuba dive shops. A lot of times they have experts that are willing to come to your class for free to show pictures and do a presentation to the students on everything that's going on in the marine environment that's specific to your location. So if you're in Malaysia, someone can come. If you're in Indonesia, if you're in um, any of the coastal countries in Africa, people can come. Uh, and I wanted to show this example from Gecko Dive, which is located in Indonesia. This shows um, a person, a diver, who is collecting debris underwater. But more importantly, it also shows that they have invited, they have gone to a classroom and visited their young students to talk about how we can protect the environment. And then they planned a beach cleanup. So they had a beach and underwater clean, cleanup and that were, was very successful. And these are all things that we can do in our different communities. So thank you very much for your time and listening. We will now continue with Kevin and some more absolutely fantastic activities. Strange weather, strange weather, strange weather. Thank you, Eve, for those great uh, ideas about project work and bringing visitors to class and adjusting those activities for your group level. What I'd like to do now is sort of bring things down to a lower level. I know a lot of people around the world um, have classes without a lot of resources. But I think we can provide all, provide all classes at all levels with activities that increase awareness about climate change. But to, we're going to do this with a bottom-up approach. That means we don't have to explain everything that we did early on. Um, but you can say every week or two incorporate small activities that remind students of the environmental challenges we face. Eve already talked about plastic. Plastic is a big problem. It's so useful. Beautiful things are made of plastic, but the problem is it's everywhere. What does plastic have to do with global warming? Well, industries produce these objects, and many of them are made to be used one time and thrown away. That means the industries produce more of them. On top of that, where do these things go? We have to throw them somewhere. So here's an awareness activity for your students. Put them in groups, give them five minutes with one piece of paper and say, write as many plastic objects as you can that you find in our classroom. They will not be able to do it. There's just far too many plastic things. So it's a very good way to make your students aware of plastic. Um, and then after that, maybe let them reflect either at home or in groups on where does plastic go? Can you answer that? Chen Carl from Taiwan says it's a good question. Where does it go? To the sea, to the water. Actually, a lot of it does end up in the water. To the trash, yeah. The trash is a better solution. The dustbin. Yeah, these end up in landfills, generally, that we cover with dirt, the ground, uh -huh, to the garbage. But lots of little pieces are eventually washed down through rivers and into the sea or into uh, ri rivers and lakes. Because plastic pieces can be very, very small. And what happens is 
this is called the gyre. The gyre is a series of currents in the ocean and plastic can circulate through this for years. So even an island where no human has ever been has probably been visited by plastic. Yes, Noor from Malaysia, the gyre, that's a new word for you probably. It's what these currents are called in the ocean. They circulate through the entire ocean. And this is again the connectedness of nature and climate change. Never heard anything about a gyre. Well, it's okay. Teachers love getting new words. I think I'm going to have another new word for you soon, too, like in a minute. So where does plastic go? And if it goes to the ocean, what happens to it? A lot of it ends up inside creatures. Studies have found plastic, big pieces inside of sharks, little pieces inside of fish. When you're eating fish, you might even be eating tiny bits of plastic yourself. Sometimes it goes into turtles. This is bad because, of course, it kills turtles. Plastic looks, looks to turtles like jellyfish. Medusa, right? And they love jellyfish. So what are these little things? Did anyone take my test that's online at the Ning? I have an eight-question online test. They look like little plastic beads, that's right, crystals. They're really, really small. There might be a thousand in that person's hand. Crystal beads, they're like beads, even small. These are called noodles. And if you take our quiz online, you'll see this. These are made from manufacturing plastics. They're very, very tiny, which means that when they spill from a ship, or somebody drops them, or a package opens somewhere, they just float forever and you can never pick them up. So they're with us basically forever. They go inside a fish because those look like delicious food to fish. Yeah, another new word for you. They're used in manufacturing of plastic products, probably melted in order to form plastic project, uh, objects. So now we know the word gyre. This is a photo I took at the wonderful Monterey Bay Aquarium in California. Our plastic floats into waterways and rides the ocean current. What's terrible is that over time, plastic actually breaks down into tiny, tiny little pieces. These are often called mermaid tears, like the nurdles. And they look like food to animals. We don't really know how this is going to affect nature in the ocean, but we doubt that it's good. Especially these plastic bags. There are millions, probably billions of them being produced. So next time you go to the store, please refuse the bag. Just bring your own. And here is a loop listening task that you can use with your students. As we play this, think about how can I use this with my students? What will my students do while listening? All right, refuse the bag. When you go to the store, refuse the bag, bring your own, recycle, reuse. When you go to the store, refuse the bag, bring your own, recycle, reuse. When you go to the store,
Refuse the bag. Bring your own. Recycle, reuse. When you go to the store, refuse the bag. Bring your own. Recycle, reuse. When you go to the store, refuse the bag. Bring your own. Recycle, reuse. Yeah, that's it. So you notice that song's very repet repetitive. New Ray said, I sing it every day when I go to the store. Great. Uh, it's a good way to remind students to refuse those plastic bags. Yes, this song is available on the name. You may download it for free. In fact, you're going to see a resource on American English with directions for how to use this loop listening song. Really easy to loop, use in class since it repeats the language so much for students. The link is on the name, but I imagine we will give it to you in a moment. Here's another activity that I love to introduce students to new vocabulary. You could have climate change cards with pictures of climate change. In this case, this was a summer camp on the Red Sea, and I wanted to introduce the learners to the animals that lived in the Red Sea. And Heather has just given you the link to those short chants and songs. These are called picture cards. They're really easy to make by yourself, whatever subject you make, you want. And again, on the name, there's a document that shows you 10 ways how to use these cards. They can be really fun. Like if I said the word turtle, a student would slap their hand down on the turtle. Then they get to keep that card. Next, I say shark. One student in a group slaps his hand down on the shark. Lots of activities that involve action on the student's part. So we have directions how to use these at shapingenglish.ning.com. Beautiful with children. Yeah, I think adults can use this as well. But once again, we want to sort of lower the denominator and make bottom-up activities that introduce environmental ideas to young learners or uh, just to introduce the subject in the classroom. Here's another one that we can do, an easy song. You may know the song that goes, he's got the whole world in his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world in his hands. Well, this song uses that pattern, and students will contribute their own words. So we started by giving students one example. Here's the example. To encourage them to pick up trash. There's a plastic bag in the garbage can. There's a plastic bag in the garbage can. There's a plastic bag in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. Next, we ask students to contribute. So there's the model or pattern. And we ask students. A student says, dirty old sock. Oh, good. There's a dirty old sock in the garbage can. There's a dirty old sock in the garbage can. There's a dirty old sock in the garbage can. We put it in the garbage can. Now it's your turn. Who can give me a good phrase, something to put in the garbage can that we want students to pick up? The chords are really easy, Nakamo. There's just two of them. C and G. But 
you don't need to be able to play an instrument. Thank you, moderator Jenny. So, there's an old box. Thank you. There's an old box in the garbage can. There's an old box in the garbage can. And now I'm going to go to Oksana from Russia. There's a broken toy car in the garbage can. There's a broken toy car in the garbage can. There's an empty milk tin in the garbage can. There's an empty milk tin in the garbage can. Okay, from Jennifer, PAS in Accra, Ghana. There's a plastic spoon in the garbage can. There's a plastic spoon in the garbage can. Raquel, Bolivia. There's a plastic there's a broken bottle in the garbage can. There's a broken... See? Great activity. Students are contributing. They're actually writing their own. And great pronunciation practice. It trains your tongue. And also, once we have a pattern, we can adjust it even more. So now I've changed two parts of that old pattern to there's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. There's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. There's a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. We gotta do something about that. Boom, boom. Okay, so really easy activities to bring into the classroom. If you don't like my song, you can do it without melody. You can take a well-known song from your culture and do the same thing. Posters. Um, Eve showed us some posters before and some great ideas for using them for public service announcements. Um, Tato, uh, someone before, one of our participants said he makes posters and takes them around. This is a great idea. Too. So you can have students create posters to inform each other, put them on the walls. Here's one about refusing plastic bags, picking up trash. Here's one about recycling. What I like to do with posters is an activity called skim, scan, and run. And you can do this for very high level of students too. For example, we would put these posters on the walls, maybe even outside. With higher level students, you can actually put entire articles from the newspaper. The idea is to put one piece of paper on a desk and students share that. Here are the instructions. Below this paper, there would be questions and they would have to find the information and then come back and write the answers on this paper on their desk. So here's a sample question. Name something that can damage coral. So the students would have to run around, look at all the pictures, posters, and find that information. You should have maybe five or ten questions. Okay, now we're going to go to some free resources from your favorite American English state gov. A local war. Can anyone tell me what a local war is? Alina from Moldova. Why do you know that? Okay, you may have heard of the word carnivore, herbivore, omnivore. So vor means eat, right? And local means to eat locally. Hmm. What does this have to do with climate change and global warming? Hmm. It's a way to reduce carbon footprint. This is available on American English. And again, this resource is for you on the name 
It's from our American Rhythms CD of music. You just go there and look for local war. And you see, you can download the text, classroom activities, and the audio for the song. What you have in the text, tons of activities. Look at all those activities that come with this song. Let's listen to it for about a minute, give you a taste of what the music is like. This is Local War by Zach Layden. I want to be a local for I want to walk to the store And play my banjo on the porch As the sun goes down I want to live with the land I want to have garden hands Everything is tweaking all through the night. I want to be treading light. I know I'm on the right track tonight. So if you want to hear the whole song, just go to American English and download this. Like I said, there's a number of activities. Many of them are language oriented, like this. This is a scramble. You just need to unscramble that sentence. There's a number of these that students can do. I want to walk to the store, right? Four Corners is a really fun activity to introduce the idea uh, in the song to students. And this, they will answer questions by going to different corners of the room. For example, one corner might be strongly agree, another corner strongly disagree. Then you give them a statement like, it's best to eat food that was made in another country. And students will go to whatever corner expresses their opinion. And also, in the activities, pictures from the song, this is a favorite activity of students. They listen, and each group has all these pictures in front of them that you will cut into pieces, and they organize them into the order in which they hear them. Really fun. So, tell me, what does a local war have to do with climate change? Why is it good to be a local? I mean, this is less CO2. Mm -hmm. That's less car gas. Good. Local products. Yes, you're right on. If you import something, say garlic, from halfway across the world, a big ship is going to take that. That big ship is going to be producing carbon dioxide emissions into the air. Whereas if it's made down the street from you, there's not going to be that kind of production involved in moving the food. Thus, lower carbon footprint and healthier. And guess what? We've got a lot of great activities on American English. You can find them collected for you on the link, Content Spotlight. On Earth Day, there's activities here. Earth Day is April 22nd, so make sure you reserve that day to talk about it in your classrooms. Summer Camp. Summer Camp is a brand new Content Spotlight with activities, including Two of those audios we heard tonight, we heard walking and refuse the bag, and some great activities, courtesy of moderator Heather. 
These are also on the name. And guess what? We've got World Oceans Day, which I believe is uh, November 8th. Is that right? So use that day as an excuse to bring it into your class and do some activities on the health of the ocean. Again, American English has activities for this. So now, when we see this photo on the wall, what did you do to save the world today? We're going to have a good answer. Because we can do little things, right? Please raise your hand if you feel that you've got a clearer understanding of what climate change is today. Okay, some people are raising their hand, that's great. I hope you'll be able to communicate this to your students, whatever their level is. These activities on American English and on the name should help you. Hey, that's me. There I am on the Red Sea. People will tell you picking up trash is not very fun, but look at how much fun we're having cleaning the sea. Each piece of plastic we pick up is not going to end up in a turtle or a fish. And we can encourage students to take things into their hands outside of the classroom. Look at this. Some Jordanians decided to make an anti-littering campaign in Jordan on Facebook. Isn't that great? I hope the water will always look this blue. So let's keep the planet cleaner and let's spread the word to our students. I hope we've made that easier for you to do today. And remember, American English also has a Facebook page. We've got 500,000 likes. We'd like to get a million. So if you could join us, Facebook will keep you informed of new things that come out on American English as well. So folks, strange weather, strange weather, strange weather. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to go over to the Republic of Georgia and pass the microphone to Eve Smith so that she can wish you goodbye as well. Thanks for joining us on today's webinar. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you everyone who took time out of their day to participate. I absolutely loved looking at all your comments. Um, and you are inspiring me. So thank you for all of your suggestions and being such a wonderful, active group of participants. I hope that you all have a wonderful evening or day, wherever in the world you are. Back to Kevin. Okay, everyone. All right, everyone, this is moderator Heather. Please join me in giving Kevin and Eve a huge round of applause. At this time, we will close our webinar and ask you all to enter your attendance. You can enter your attendance in the uh, box there on the bottom left hand side. If you are watching this webinar as an individual, please submit your email address only as shown in the example. If you are watching with a viewing group, please submit your email address, that is the host's email address, and the total number of participants viewing the session with you. As you're entering your attendance, take some time to think about the many uh, great ideas that were shared by Kevin and Eve about this global problem 
and the activities uh, that are language focused that we can bring to our classroom to help not only raise awareness about climate change, global warming, and the environment, but what we can do about the issue. So thank you all. We look forward to seeing you on uh, October 22nd, two weeks from today, for our next webinar by Beth Shepard that will be called, entitled Practical Activities for Balanced Listening Instruction. Thank you so much, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.